Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. I'm a real light sleeper, child. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, aka Night Warning, released February 1st, 1982. It was written by Stephen Brimer, Alan J. Gluckman, and Boone Collins, based on a story by Gluckman and Collins directed by William Asher, with uncredited work from Michael Miller, and released by Comworld Pictures, who would only release around 17 titles in their seven-year existence. It's funny that it has an AKA that makes as little sense as the actual right? title. Right? Yeah, neither one of them. <laughs> and I really like this title. Yeah, but it needs not to, for this. Not for this, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> the story was pitched by co-screenwriter Alan J. Gluckman, based loosely, I hope, on his experiences growing up gay and adopted. That story was expanded into a screenplay, and regular Roger Corman collaborator Michael Miller was attached to direct. Miller and cinematographer Jan de Bont got as far as the film's opening car crash before their removal by producers for running behind schedule. Miller was replaced with William Asher, who then installed DP Robbie Greenberg to take over de Bont's role. The earliest draft of the script was entitled Mother's Dead, and it went through so many iterations. <laughs> It was briefly called Mama's Boy, The Evil Protégé, Scared to Death, which was already a film that we've yeah. covered. <laughs> so they changed it to Thrilled to Death. And lastly, Mrs. Lynch, on the way to the arguably worst fitting title, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Do you guys recall the last film we covered that was nearly released with a Butcher Baker title? Oh, was it Scream? It was Scream. Mm. Good memory. Yeah, at the very beginning of the film, I remember they we had see like a fireplace figurines. mantle with a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick yeah. maker. And that was the original title of the film. Jimmy McNichol was a teen star at the time and so barely edged out co-star Bill Paxton for the lead. McNichol's agents also represented Bo Svensson and attached him as the film's homophobic lieutenant. Daryl Hannah and Ali Sheedy both actually auditioned for the Julie part on the way to selected actress Julia Duffy. The character of Aunt Cheryl was based originally on Baby Jane, of whatever happened to Baby Jane, and intended for Patty Duke to play, since director Asher had created, or co-created, the Patty Duke show. Bizarrely, the following year, the distributor changed the name again to Night Warning for a re-release. The Night Warning poster includes this tagline. They didn't go looking for trouble, they were just too curious. Now they know too much to live. What? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe they sold the poster mm -hmm. first and they had to find yeah. something that they could call Night Warning. And they were like, let's just give him Butcher Baker. <laughs> we'll just say it's called Night Warning now. Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, retitled again, perhaps mistakenly as just Nightmare Maker, landed in section two of UK's infamous video nasty list. We open directly into a title card as Susan Tyrell playing Aunt Cheryl steps out of a house carrying a baby we will come to know as Billy. The boy's parents are leaving for a multi-week vacation to see their own parents, and Cheryl is babysitting. They're leaving the baby with her sister so they can go see Grandma and Grandpa. Why wouldn't you bring the baby? Yeah, I don't know. What's going on here? When the mother leans down to kiss her son, Susan Tyrell suddenly jerks the kid up and bonks her mother in the face, and it doesn't look on purpose, and it looks painful. The baby cries as his parents drive away, and we freeze frame on Aunt Cheryl's creepy stare for a moment. I, it doesn't help that it's Susan Tyrell. It's like automatically creepy yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. There's a lot of like weird random freeze frames. Yeah. As Billy's parents drive through a mountain pass, they realize their car's brakes are failing. They begin speeding uncontrollably and swerve around the mountain traffic as best they can until they slam into the back of an overloaded logging truck. One of the longest pieces of wood punches straight through the windshield, demolishing the father's head on its way through the car. And then the vehicle skids off the side of the road tumbling end over end down the mountain and exploding in a riverbed at the bottom. I was not, I was not expecting them to get Final Destination. Like, yeah. it was yeah. so, like, I, first of all, I feel like there's other ways that you can get this car to slow down and get it under control. And or Yeah, it maybe, seems like he's got pedal to the metal or the Or maybe, time. like, yeah. 
crash it more intentionally so that mm-hmm. you don't yeah. fall off the cliff. You this know? happened to a friend of mine in elementary school. He, he was in a motorhome with his parents and the brakes went out on oh. a mountain road. I think they were on their way I to like... you were about to tell me a logging truck dropped No, no, no. But, but he did the thing where you steer into the mountain instead yeah, of yeah, driving yeah. off yeah, the yeah, cliff. Yeah, yeah. And it tipped That's over the motorhome, but it just skidded along the street and then they got out of it. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Can't you put it into like a lower gear and like the you compression? You would think, yeah. The compression of the engine that helps slow you down. Yeah. I was thinking, though, when the car went off the cliff, uh, I was thinking of Chris Elliott and Groundhog's Day. He's like, he can still be okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, he's probably <laughs> he probably didn't make it then. <laughs> it's so cruel, too, because the dad is dead instantly. This yeah. log punches his lights out. He's gone. But <laughs> the woman is screaming and trying to right the vehicle the entire time. And it's hooked on the back of this truck, so she can't keep it from being dragged over the side of the road. And she's screaming the whole way down. <laughs> until it lands in the water and then explodes again. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a child apparently orphaned by a car accident sending his parents off a cliff? Uh, was it the Earthling? That's right. A photo of their son floats out of the car into the river. The camera zooms into the boy's face, and then we dissolve 14 years into the future to the photo of the boy, now played by Jimmy McNichol, with his Aunt Cheryl. Upon waking to her radio clock, Aunt Cheryl moves through the house to Billy's room and digs through his wallet to find a photo of his girlfriend and a condom. She leans over the sleeping boy and purrs in his ear to wake him up before granting him five more minutes in bed. She's also like Ugh. clawing at his back like a cat. There's there's so many moments in here where she is so creepy yeah. with how she interacts with him. Like it just it, it just sends shivers down my spine. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying. Billy rushes through the kitchen drinking from the milk carton and heads out to school without touching the breakfast Cheryl has prepared. He asks if his girlfriend Julie can join them for his birthday dinner, but she says it's just for the two of them. I am going to be your date tomorrow night. Sorry. Whatever makes you happy. I'll see you tonight. You make me happy. Billy rides his motorbike to school, and we cut to basketball practice, shirts versus skins. Billy's girlfriend Julie is taking snapshots of her shirtless boyfriend on the court. Julie kind of looks like a cross between Laura Linney and Annette O'Toole. And at first I was sure it was one of them, but it's not. She's too young to be either one. Yeah, I can definitely see the Annette O'Toole for yeah. sure. But these freeze frames are also distracting as she's taking the photographs that looks like the picture's freezing. Billy's doing pretty well and even manages to steal the ball from a jock named Eddie, played by Bill Paxton, who accuses Billy of a foul. After practice, Coach wants to talk to Billy, and then Eddie stops to chat as well, but Coach slaps him on the ass and says they'll talk later. Eddie warns Billy never to touch him again, but Billy disputes the foul in the first place. Back at Cheryl's place, her friend Margie is picking up a young boy she has left in Cheryl's care. Is this supposed to be Margie's kid or grandkid or niece or nephew? What's going on some, here? Some some kid that they have. <laughs> Why are you leaving it with Cheryl? She's so scary. Well, I, I had a theory going in later on uh, that Margie was going to be in on all of this. Oh, okay. That makes <laughs> sense. And I was super excited for this yeah. reveal. Margie tries to set Cheryl up with a 35-year-old she knows, but Cheryl isn't interested. Margie's husband, Frank, honks a horn incessantly from the curb, summoning Margie away. Margie warns Cheryl that when Billy moves out, she'll need help around the house. After his meeting with Coach, Billy is surprised by his girlfriend who pops out suddenly to snap photos of him in the school hall. He apologizes for staying so late and tells her they'll have to talk another time because he's already late for dinner with Aunt Cheryl. At home, he tells Cheryl that the coach thinks he can get a full scholarship for his basketball skills. Cheryl tells him to forget about the University of Denver because she's already got a job lined up for him next year. It also occurs to her that Julie is going to the same school and she tells him they can't afford it. The college is for rich kids and people with brains. You wouldn't fit in there. She reminds him that she will need his help around the house and he suggests moving out when he does. He doesn't think she needs such a huge property. I like that she tries to nag him into staying. (laughs) You're such a dummy though. Mm -hmm. Just stay here. She demands again that he stay here with her and when he refuses, she slaps him. She blames him for upsetting her and rushes off to bed. The next morning, we see her carry a tray of preserves out to a shed in the yard, and she speaks to a candlelit altar about her fights with Billy. These candles are just going nonstop out here? Yep. Mm -hmm. The next morning, Cheryl wakes Billy with a birthday card and an apology with her blessing to try for the scholarship. She tells Billy to make an appointment with the TV repairman this afternoon. She'd do it herself, but she'll be gift shopping for the birthday boy. At school, Julie is very excited to learn they might end up at the same college. Back at the house, 
Cheryl paints her toenails and hums what sounds to me like the chorus of Jesus Christ Superstar. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God, that is my exact note. But it's not. It's not. It's the theme from the movie. Yeah, but I, it, it's just that first bit. Yeah. <laughs> and I, every time she starts it, I was like, why is she singing just those six notes of it? Do you guys recall the last time we had a character in the film somehow know the score to their own <laughs> film? I'm, I don't remember that. Now, I know we've had it more recently than this example, because this is like our sixth episode or something like that. It's in our first ten. I don't remember at all. Fatso. Mm. There's a scene where Dom DeLuise and Anne Bancroft are dancing in her store, and they're like, ah, da, 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 da. Get out of here! <laughs> and then we realized halfway through the review, like, oh, they're singing the score to the film. <laughs> Later, as the repairman finishes up his work, Aunt Cheryl tries to force herself on him sexually, and he shoves her away. Look, lady, I'm just not interested, okay? She chases him through the kitchen with her tits out, and he tries to compromise with the desperate woman by agreeing to a blowjob from her, but she slaps him hard. When he turns his back on her to leave, she snatches a kitchen knife off the wall and stabs him in the back, and then a second time in the neck, just as Billy walks by the kitchen window and sees everything. He runs inside to break up the fight, and Aunt Cheryl is immediately accusing the dead man of attempted rape. She rubs the man's blood all over her nephew, and she repeats her claim over and over. Outside, Frank and Margie arrive with a cake for the party and stumble upon the same bloody scene, and Cheryl hugs Margie too yeah. and gets blood all over yet another person. Also, the first thing Billy does is remove the knife right. from the body and just holds it, <laughs> yeah. making sure his fingerprints are all on there yeah. nice and tight. Hours later, police are on the scene, and Lieutenant Joe Carlson, played by Bo Svensson, doubts the rape story already, <laughs> which is like, it's played to make it look like he's very observant. Yeah. <laughs> it turns yeah, out he's yeah. just an asshole. <laughs> He's just an asshole sexist cop from the 1980s. You buy attempted rape? No. Do you? No. It wasn't his day. Poor guy didn't even get his pecker out. Then we get a positively bizarre back and forth between Carlson and the medical examiner. How the twins? They're fine, Joe. You gonna have that operation? What operation? The second. Hell no. Does this medical examiner have conjoined <laughs> twins at home? <laughs> or is he talking about twin boys getting circumcised? It's a weird detail to sprinkle over the yeah. scene either way. <laughs> he collects Billy's testimony and suspects he's lying when the story matches up with Cheryl's word for word. The most damning detail seems to be that Billy was holding the bloody knife when Margie and Frank got there. Lieutenant Carlson suspects Aunt Cheryl is covering for her nephew. When he shouts to Cheryl with more questions, she nervously pops a birthday balloon in her hands, and the look in Margie's face is incredible. First she's surprised by the pop, and then she's so angry at herself for reacting to it. But I really love what she's doing. This Margie character is yeah. so funny. Mm -hmm. She tells the detective to leave Cheryl alone, and he is not amused. Why don't you stop tormenting her? Are you talking to me, lady? Yes. Don't. The next day, when Billy gets home from school, he finds Aunt Cheryl burning a lot of old paperwork in the fireplace. He asks why she has a fire going in this heat, and she says she's making room in the attic so she can convert it into an apartment for him next year. Yeah. I have a room already. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, also, like, the whole concept was like, it's awful hot for a fire. It's like, clearly she's not, like, burning wood yeah. and, like, trying to keep cozy. There's a pile of, like, documents. Yeah, this is very weird. Billy heads up to the attic to have a look around, and it's packed to the gills with dusty boxes. Everything is fully cobwebbed over. He finds more boxes of paperwork before a rat scares him out of the attic, and he falls down the stairs into the house. Supposedly, this is actually Jimmy doing the stair stunt here. It looks super painful. When Cheryl finds him disoriented on the floor, she tells him not to go back up there until it's ready. In the pile of stuff, Billy finds a newspaper article with devil horns drawn on a man's head. Cheryl calls the man Chuck Strang and describes him as a weird ex of Billy's mom. The next day at basketball practice, Lieutenant Carlson pulls Coach Landers aside for questioning. Carlson notices a ring on Coach Landers' hand and mentions finding a matching ring on the hand of the victim, Phil Brody, which both rings have both of their initials by coincidence. He has deduced that the men were lovers and thus Aunt Cheryl's attempted rape accusation holds no water. As progressive a move as it was to portray these gay men as non-stereotypically as we've seen in the 1980s, Lieutenant Carlson reminds us of the presiding attitude of the era. I suggest you resign. If you don't, chances are you're going to get yourself lynched. 
Back in Aunt Cheryl's preserve shed, we see her taking a crowbar to a boarded up door frame. She carries a candelabra inside and speaks to someone in the darkness. It's more photos of the man she called Chuck Strang. She confesses to the framed photo that she staged the false attack to convince Billy that she can't survive alone here. But the fact that she killed her assailant <laughs> yeah. kind of proves the opposite. Well, uh, but additionally, I, I'm a little confused about her plan here because it seems to be putting Billy in harm's way mm -hmm. of, of potentially going to jail. Yeah, for this. because she's she's done a lot of the legwork to frame him for this. It, it, it does seem like that. Like, I don't. I don't think her intent I don't was think so to either. frame him, but no. but it seems like she's... But it's like, unless you're going to confess and go to jail, he's going to. Yeah, it does seem like... She, and she is confessing and uh, that, that she killed right. him. She is insisting that she did that, but it just seems odd that... I guess she didn't make Billy take the knife out and hold it right, up yeah, yeah, over yeah. the body yeah, while other idea. people walked in. It's like, like the killer from uh, A Stranger Is Watching. Where he's like, hmm, a bloody hammer. Yeah. Anyway, why is your mom sleeping so hard? <laughs> so Yeah, but even so, this plan, I, again, I know she's not, well, I, can, I guess you could argue that she's a clever murderer. Sure. Because she already has gotten away with it twice. But she, she, obviously this guy didn't show up on her gaydar either. Yeah. <laughs> That's another problem that she has to deal with now. But, uh, but the whole concept of, I'm going to say that he tried to rape me and then kill him in front of Billy. I don't think that was her plan. No? I think her plan was, I'm going to have sex with this guy and then say that he raped me so that Billy thinks I'm going to get raped by mm -hmm. people if he moves out. Oh, so but the when the guy turned her down, she flew into a rage mm. and killed him. Okay, that makes more sense. Suddenly, Britt Leach as Sergeant Cook is knocking at her door and when no one answers, he walks through the house into the kitchen where she nearly cracks him in the face with a crowbar. She continues threatening the man until he leaves because he entered without a search warrant. Yeah. You can't right. just walk right into a house. Yeah, he tries to do the whole thing. I was like, well, I heard a noise and I thought someone might need help. Like, it's like, yeah, nah, it's not going to hold up. I mean, it would because he's a cop and they'd just be like, yeah, you're right. Definitely heard a noise. She bashes the crowbar against her butcher block kitchen island. And I hope this was all planned or the crowbar is plastic because otherwise she done fucked it up. <laughs> like she hits <laughs> it like spike down in the middle of the wood. During a lunch break at school, Eddie finds Billy and implies that him and the coach had a homosexual relationship. In retaliation, Billy dumps milk over Eddie's head and they beat each other senseless in the yard. So who, I, this is what I don't understand. Did Carlson tell the school board or someone? Because how, how did it come out that the coach was gay? He resigned. Right, but you can resign without admitting that you're gay. No, you can't. <laughs> they're, they're telling you the form you need of to reason, say why and you need to say for, it loud enough for the entire campus to hear yeah, the, the reason for resignation there's like bubbles when there's one yeah. for other uh yeah. but yeah it's like i don't get why this information had come out yeah and let because the coach well, had not i mean rumors he's rumors not spread being very discreet quickly. about his investigation here i remember mm. when something happened at my high school that's true and everybody knew within 45 minutes on the whole <laughs> campus and i don't think the cops were blurting it out to people when the fight is broken up, Billy leaves with Julie. Back at home, Billy practices more basketball and his front yard hoop when Lieutenant Carlson shows up with more questions. He asks Billy if it bothered him to learn Coach Landers was gay, but of course, he doesn't say gay. He says a different word. Then he asks if Billy's gay, but again, using a different word. A less acceptable word. Carlson explains further that the victim found here was also gay, and so Aunt Cheryl's story must be fabricated. Carlson admits his theory on the case, that Billy is gay and in a relationship with his coach, and so a fight broke out between him and Phil Brody over Coach Landry. He still suspects Aunt Cheryl is covering for the kid. We even see Carlson's theory played out as a flashback with Billy doing all the stabbing. I thought that was interesting to actually shoot the scene the mm -hmm. way that the guy thinks it happened. As the lieutenant walks away, Billy reels back to nail him in the back of the head with his basketball, and Carlson cautions him against it without even turning around. You do that, Billy, so help me God. Break your arm. He also gives Billy a basketball tip for shooting with a limper wrist. Then he jokes that that should be easy for the boy. That night, Billy doesn't have an appetite and just pushes potatoes around on his plate. A screenshot of this exact take is currently Jimmy McNichol's IMDb photo. <laughs> Cheryl asks Billy if he knew Coach Landers was gay and accuses all gay people of being very, very sick. But Billy is an ally. Do you know that, Billy? Coach Landers is not sick. Billy! The next day at school, Landers is packing up the stuff in the equipment room because he's leaving the school for good to avoid the wrath of the town. He tells Billy to call him anytime if he's in any trouble. This movie really did 
surprise me with how progressively it handled these topics. I thought for sure that that was an indicator that the director was gay. But he was not, but the person who wrote the story wrote and, right. and wrote the script right. for it. But, so it does fact, make sense that he would be more realistic about it. The fact that it held up all the way through production yes. is shocking to me. I agree. And that, you know, they didn't... I mean, I, there's a lot of horror movies of this time that are going to use, you know, gay tropes to try to, like, excuse things or make... But, but nowhere in this does any you know, gayness fall into, like, the reason why something bad happens. Right. And it's it's never stereotypical in any way. Literally, the the only problem that arises from the fact that these characters are gay is that it punches holes in a murderer's story about what happened. So it's, like, literally, it's it's helping to solve the mystery well, and that they were gay. And throughout the entire thing, that you know, it's, it's highly emphasizing how bad a you know like a, a, a shake at the world that this coach is getting just right. because of this thing that he you know it has nothing to do with right and and it has nothing to do with him or the fact that he's gay but you know it's still it's still cruel to him yeah we cut to the police station where lieutenant carlson is chewing everybody out the statistics don't look good right now rape is up 18 percent and child molestation is up three percent i want to see like that ticker tape going around the room <laughs> <laughs> A passing prostitute has choice words for the lieutenant, and he responds in kind. Fuck you! And fuck you! <laughs> but before before that, he's like, what are you doing here, Nancy? <laughs> fuck you! <laughs> fuck you! But his, his questioning of her, of like, what are you doing here? He seems almost yeah. concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's just how they say hi. Coach Lander stops by Carlson's office, and before he can even say a word, Carlson accuses the man of molesting a child the night before, purely on the basis of his sexual orientation. Weirdly, the molestation victim that he's talking about is also named Billy, which I feel like you're just trying to confuse your audience at this point. He's like, oh, a young boy named Billy something. It's like, we haven't talked about Billy's last name, so did something else happen that we missed? Right. This is very confusing. Landers is here on Billy's behalf to mention that Phil Brody might have been bisexual because prior to their relationship, Brody was married to a woman. Carlson doesn't care and laughs off the tip because he's already decided on an official story. I do think this is the one weird thing that Landers does, that he comes here with a man who he exchanged rings with. Like, you trust this person and you're willing to come here and say he probably tried to rape a woman to get one of your students off of a murder charge. Like, that seems a, a weird thing to do to throw your partner under the bus for that. That's the one thing that I feel like is, is odd about this Landers character. That is a weird choice because I guess maybe he's trying to I mean, I guess the clear Billy. I mean, clearly that's what he's trying to do. But it's it's weird that he's prioritizing Billy over the memory of his partner unless it's just a situation where it's like, I know Billy didn't do this. So and he's, and, you know, if he's the only dead, way to so. protect Billy is to throw a corpse under the bus, then who cares? Yeah. On the wall behind Carlson here, we see some impressive awards, though. He has a bronze star and a purple heart. Carlson's heard enough and orders Landers out of the building. After Coach leaves, Carlson complains to his dog, Mackie, that Landers is a deviant. Back at the school, Billy invites Julie to hang out at his house tonight because Aunt Cheryl will be home late after a road trip to Sonoma with Margie and Frank. We cut to Carlson questioning Julie outside her home. He wants to know the nature of their relationship. Which is totally inappropriate. Right. I need to know if you two are making it. That's none of your business. He explains the context of his inquiry, but she still refuses to comment. We cut right to Julie and Billy naked in bed together. Billy stands to get her a drink, and we cut to the POV of someone peeking in the windows from outside the house. She admits to Billy that Lieutenant Carlson stopped by to talk to her today. It seems his questions have inspired paranoia in her, and she wants to know if there's a reason that they rarely have sex. Presumably she's worried that he's actually gay, like Carlson does. The POV from outside is now inside and climbs the stairs to Billy's room. Aunt Cheryl throws open the door to catch them in the act. You get dressed and get that slut out of here! Minutes later, we see a fully dressed Julie rushing out of the house and crashing into Sergeant Cook in the shadows of the front yard. She explains they were just caught in bed together, and Cook suggests that information is good for Billy's case. Inside, Billy tries to take a shower, and again, Cheryl bursts in to order him never to sleep with that girl again. She steps back out to the shed to speak to her framed photo some more. She tells Chuck that she'll keep Billy here the same way she kept Chuck here. Okay, so, so she's got stuff in the shed, Yeah, but she also has stuff in the attic behind a boarded up... <clears throat> no, that was also in the shed. The that boarded up all... room is in the back of the shed. 
But she just nails the boards back up every time? No, I think she just cracked it open and she's leaving it open this okay. time. It's been closed for a long time and she's suddenly needing to talk to Chuck again. Okay. About More these directly new than his shrine. Right. Yeah. He she has like a candle shrine on the outside of where she keeps the pictures and everything. Right. But she boarded up the actual room with everything else in it. But then she also has a basement with stuff? That that's it's all the shed. That's all the shed. There's just okay. there's two rooms in the shed. There's the room where she has all the pickled stuff, and there was a boarded up doorway I, to a further back room. I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but it probably doesn't matter uh, because later um, Julie talks about stuff in the basement. Yeah, I, I think it's the uh, the shed is part of the basement. I I think where she when she go we see her come out of the house and go downstairs and okay. go around the back of the house and go through a door to put all this pickled stuff away. She's putting it in, like, it's like the house is on a hill, kind of, mm. and so there's a basement that's under the house that like she a, uses. like a cellar. Right, kind yeah. Of. Okay, all right. At the police station the next day, Cook tells Carlson that his lover's quarrel theory might be a wild goose chase, and he mentions the accident that killed Billy's parents. Now, I talked to a few of the locals, and they remember that there were rumors about the brakes being tampered with. Good. I hope you're doing this shit. On your own time. Because I forbid you for doing it on department time. So what does that mean? That there was a rumor that the brakes had been tampered with? There's either an official report that they had or had not been tampered with. I think what he's saying is that police at the time swept it under the rug and said, car accident. But that there was testimony given from witnesses, character witnesses, to this Cheryl person Mm. that... She's a weirdo, and it's not a coincidence that she was taking care of someone else's baby and that those people died and that she decided to just raise that baby. We cut to Cheryl's house as she makes an extra glass of milk for Billy and mixes in an extra ingredient. Chemical X. No, I don't know what it is, but it's something. She's got an eyedropper, and she's drugging the boy. He's about to leave for a basketball game, and she begs him to stay for a glass of milk first. (laughs) That's what I want right before a basketball game. Mm -hmm. Big, ice-cold glass of milk. Milk was a bad choice. (laughs) She wins him over by agreeing to comply with the scholarship if he gets it. Even though Billy leaves without her for the game, when he gets there, she's in the stands already watching somehow. Billy warns his girlfriend before the game that he's already feeling dizzy and he hopes he isn't coming down with something. The game starts well and Billy is a star player scoring all the team's points flawlessly, but after some time he starts moving sluggishly. In the stands, Aunt Cheryl seems worried that he's doing too well after drinking his special milk. Billy finally misses a layup and gets fouled out of bounds. When he lines up for his free throws, he can barely see the hoop and misses twice. As soon as he's back in play, he loses control of the ball and collapses against a wall under the hoop. Julie is quickly by his side and Aunt Cheryl yanks her off to check on the boy. He wakes up in the attic apartment that Cheryl promised him and it's still crowded with children's toys from when he was a baby. He asks what happened during the game, and she blames a concussion, basically. She's like, you hit your head, you fell asleep, you need bed rest. He tries to get up to see Julie like he promised, but Cheryl insists on more bed rest. She shows him a jewelry box she found full of his mother's things and then promises to make him lunch in bed. She also tries to give him a bracelet, and she's like, it's like a charm bracelet. And she's like, this is your mother's. She was wearing it when she died. And I backed it up. She's not wearing it when she died. <laughs> like, it's just a thing that she found. She's like, oh, put this on. E- even so. Like, Where did you get it? Yeah. Is there blood in this? Yeah, or burnt mom. Yeah. I also feel like this is not a lucky charm. <laughs> From what I understand of her death, maybe that's the only reason she survived for the whole trip down the mountain face. <laughs> In the kitchen downstairs, she adds a few more special drops to the rest of the milk carton. Billy sneaks into Cheryl's room and tries looking through her dresser and cabinets for clues. He pulls out the same jewelry box and starts reading through some of the letters inside. Dear Cheryl, even though we've known each other for two weeks, I know this is the start of something very special in the kitchen. Suddenly, Aunt Cheryl is standing in the doorframe with a tray full of lunch and drops it to the floor. It's too late, though. He's learned one of her many secrets from this box. Why didn't you tell me the truth? About what? Chuck Strang was your boyfriend, not my mother's. Honey. <laughs> Phil Brody didn't try to rape you, did he? Billy. He did. You know he did. You saw it. Aunt Cheryl, there's something wrong. You're 
lying to me? Why would I ever want to lie to you? That's a good question. I don't know why she lied about the Chuck Strang thing. Why couldn't she just say that was my ex-boyfriend? She didn't lie about it. The Chuck Strang guy is her ex-boyfriend. <clears throat> she didn't lie about it. She said, this is an ex-boyfriend of your mother's. Okay. <laughs> I didn't catch that. Okay. Very More clever. Spoiler. You are technically spoiler alert. correct. Well, Sorry. Maybe, the best maybe he dated <laughs> both of them. <laughs> the best kind of correct. <laughs> Just correct. No, technically correct. Oh, technically correct. <laughs> it's a it's a common Reddit refrain. Oh. <laughs> technically correct. The best kind of correct. <laughs> Lieutenant Carlson drags a Mexican man into his office <laughs> by his scalp and throws him on the floor and then pulls out a revolver and puts it in the guy's face while he interrogates him. This brutal interrogation is interrupted by another visit from Sergeant Cook, who just doesn't seem to notice this happening at all. <laughs> he just walks in. He's like, hey, you know that thing that happened? He's like, oh, sorry, you're doing something, I guess. <laughs> uh, he mentions that Cheryl had an ex-boyfriend named Chuck Strang who disappeared one day without taking anything with him. Carlson could not care less about this revelation. Left his clothes and everything. Hasn't been heard of since. You look tired, Cook. You need some rest. On home. As a matter of fact, I don't even mind if you go on vacation. From outside Cheryl's house, we can hear scissors snipping away, and inside we see Cheryl has trimmed her hair very short. I think this is how her hair looked in the cold open, and supposedly whenever we see it longer in the film, she's actually wearing a wig. This was her actual haircut during the production, and she arranged for a haircutting scene because she hated this wig so much. <laughs> but she's sort of channeling Pamela Reed here, like specifically like kindergarten cop Pamela Reed. Right. We see Billy slide a note under the door for his aunt before he leaves the house. That night, we hear Cheryl chatting again with Chuck's pictures in the shed, but this time, she turns away from the pictures to address a question in a different direction, and we follow her line of sight to a headless, mummified corpse in the corner. Presumably, this is missing person Chuck Strang, whose case Sergeant Cook has just reopened. Outside the house, Billy has recruited Julie to distract Aunt Cheryl while he sneaks back into the jewelry box. She's reluctant because the woman clearly hates her, but ultimately agrees to the plan. I probably wouldn't make my girlfriend do this if my crazy aunt had recently stabbed someone and yes. then lied about why. <laughs> Predictably, Cheryl is furious to find this girl in her home, but Julie stands her ground and refuses to leave until she said what she came to say. But she doesn't really say anything. She's just like, hey, like me. I like your, your nephew, like me. Julie courageously discusses her relationship with Billy, even while Cheryl pounds flailingly at a skirt stake on her butcher block with a big wooden tenderizer. Cheryl admits that she still sees Billy as her baby, but claims to understand where Julie is coming from. She offers Julie a tearful hug and asks her to collect more meat from the fridge. As soon as Julie gets the door open, she is cracked in the head with the wooden tenderizer. Her grip on the fridge door loosens and Julie falls out of frame. Cheryl redrugs the milk more thoroughly this time, but before she can head upstairs to catch Billy, Margie wanders up to the porch with a pie. Billy seems to have found something important and tucks it away while he hears Margie's voice downstairs. Margie sets the pie and some magazines on the kitchen counter. Amusingly, one of these magazines is Playboy, which I can't imagine that Cheryl was approving of, unless she's just bringing her own mail into the house while she delivers a pie and <laughs> she's going to turn around with it. Cheryl wanders into the kitchen to find Margie with her hair all flipped out crazy-like. Margie can't stifle her laughter. Your hair! <gasps> You lie? Yeah. I did it myself. I think it makes me look younger. Oh, oh, definitely. Billy pops into the kitchen, and Cheryl freaks out because she thought he was sleeping upstairs this whole time. Apparently, she didn't get his note. He asks where Julie went because Julie's mom said she was headed this way, and Cheryl claims to have sent Julie back home. She goes to collect the drugged milk from the fridge, and we can see Julie blood all over the inside of the refrigerator shelves. But somehow, Billy and Margie don't notice this. I guess it could be jam or something. <laughs> it's very clearly <laughs> blood everywhere. Cheryl pours Billy a glass and then wipes down the fridge blood with her shawl. Because of Cheryl's overzealous milk drugging, Billy collapses almost immediately. Hours later, he wakes with Cheryl and Margie standing over him. Cheryl excuses Margie to go home now that Billy's awake. With the little energy Billy can muster, he fishes a birth certificate out of his pocket to reveal he's learned one of Cheryl's bigger secrets. I'm your mother. Margie is still listening from outside the door and shocked by the news. Cheryl says Chuck was Billy's dad, and he threatened to leave her rather than marry her. Cheryl's sister and her husband adopted the child to raise him, but Cheryl had a change of heart. But then I wanted you back. So I had to be right back. 
She seemed on the verge of admitting to have killed her sister and brother-in-law, right. Billy's adoptive parents, to reclaim her child. But what was the logic of giving him away in the first place? She had a huge house. She's obviously been providing for him this whole time. Why randomly give up your child to your sister if you care this much about him? Like, I don't, I don't see how this deepens the story. Well... I think it's creepier if she took someone else's kid. The, the, the only thing I could think would be that she didn't want the kid with Chuck or she gives the, she gives the baby up and then Chuck leaves her yeah. or decides to leave her. So uh, so she kills Chuck, but now her only connection to Chuck is the kid. Yeah. So she needs sure. to have the kid back. That's, that's grasping. Yeah. I'm really grasping at that. I but. think it would mean more to the story if he was finding out here that she was not his mother that she had been posing as his mother the whole time and he found out here that she was his aunt and that his mother had died mm -hmm. with the brakes getting cut but i feel like finding out the opposite is like wait then who were those other two people why do we care about them at all like they're just two people who wandered in and adopt your baby for a, a few months and then gave it back and then and, they died and then you you let the baby adopting you can annul it I guess that's too similar to fade to black though because wasn't that the situation where the woman the whole time is talking about how his his mom his, his mom died young or something or had to give up her career and then he found out that she was his mom but that she never told him it's like the same same exact story <laughs> it's like this kid who who grows up with this overly aggressive mom who tries to sabotage all his relationships and uh thinks of him as a boyfriend until <laughs> something happens <laughs> Well, and, and I mean, it's a matter of record. Right. His birth certificate. So, uh, yeah, he's never been to a hospital this whole time. Yeah. And so, and even so like the couple died and you're the birth mother. Why raise him as an adopted son nephew? when he's your actual son? Yeah. yeah. Margie hides in a closet as Cheryl comes downstairs to answer the phone. It's Julie's mom calling in search of her daughter, and Cheryl says she hasn't been to the house all day, in striking contrast with what she told Margie and Billy earlier. As soon as Cheryl hangs up, Margie calls her out on this lie. I thought you told Billy that Julie had been here. Do you always listen on other people's phone conversations? Margie claims she only stuck around to close all the windows in case it begins to rain. She asks for permission to use the phone so Frank can come pick her up, but Cheryl says, take an umbrella and get out. At the police station, Julie's mother calls Sergeant Cook to report her disappearance. He offers to check Cheryl's place for signs of the girl. On his way out, Cook orders backup to the same address and instructs his secretary to notify Carlson where he's going. While taking an umbrella out of the closet, Margie finds Julie's camera and bag. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a stolen camera labeled with the owner's name in red embossing tape? Here's a hint. We noticed in the episode that the name on the embossing tape was actually wrong they they misnamed the character hmm. her name went from sarah marshall to sarah mitchell because they literally labeled the prop wrong it sounds familiar but i can't i can't place it is it a horror film nope canadian tax shelter movie insufferable comedy oh, there's so many mm. i know that's like half of those movies <laughs> are, are baby seals clubbed in no, this movie <laughs> but it does have the same lead actor from that movie but he doesn't interact with any of the other characters directly because he's in a helicopter the whole time. Oh, uh -huh. it's a gas. gas? Yeah, it's gas. Ugh. Upstairs, Cheryl is trying to re-drug Billy by just pouring milk straight into his mouth now. Downstairs, Margie pulls a fake-out door slam to imply she's left. Margie hides in a bathroom while Cheryl passes her on the way downstairs. We cut to Julie waking up in the cobwebbed shed with Chuck Strang's mummy. Her hair is matted in thick blood where she was bludgeoned, but she's alive still. The mummy has no head, but Julie immediately finds it floating in one of Aunt Cheryl's pickle jars. Oh, I never put, I she's didn't put two and two stuff. together that yeah. she was pickling stuff and that's what she did to the head. Oh, that's funny. When Margie finally decides it's time to leave, she sneaks out the door into the rain, but she's moving down the dirt path to the street when she hears purring from the bushes and encounters Aunt Cheryl, who slashes her across the belly with a machete and then leaves her to bleed out in the yard. Julie uses a stick to bust her way out of a window in the locked shed. She takes refuge in a dark equipment room and panics when she finds Aunt Cheryl in here with her. Cheryl reels back with the machete again, just as Sergeant Cook opens the door and reaches in to pull the chain on a light bulb down here. He hasn't even let go of the chain when Cheryl cleanly slices his hand off, which hangs on the chain for a moment before falling to the floor. Cheryl takes another deep swing at the man's neck 
and Julie throws a heavy rope at the woman before running out the door with Cheryl's machete. Cheryl finds an axe and begins chasing her again. Upstairs, Billy is waking from his latest drugging and hears Julie's screams outside. As she runs from Cheryl, Julie trips over Margie's body and screams more. Cheryl swings the axe down at the girl, but Julie dodges it at the last second, and the weapon is lodged in Margie's <laughs> dead leg. <laughs> it takes her a second to pry it loose before she can resume the chase. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's a really funny moment, and it, and it takes a second to uh, yeah. just, like, step on her leg to get it out. I do like that all the characters, for the most part, do exactly what I think they should do. Like, right, take yeah. Take the machete with you. Not a lot of you know, stupid like, mistakes. Yeah. So I, it, I think it makes these interesting, these movies more interesting when you don't think people have made a whole bunch of mistakes to get right. here. Absolutely. Julie and Cheryl are suddenly wrestling each other in a pond until Cheryl gets Julie up against the edge of the water and cracks her a few times in the skull with a huge rock. Oh, man. It, I was like, okay. It's so disturbing. It, and, and, and for sure... She's dead yeah. this time, right? Right. I was shocked that she was even getting hit with this rock because I was like, wow, we did the whole fake out thing and then we're going to kill her anyway. That's mm-hmm. so fucked up. But she's hitting her really hard with this rock. She's not going to make the same mistake twice. That's insane that we're killing this character right after we resurrected her. Inside the house, Billy tumbles disoriented down the stairs. Outside, Cheryl's POV limps toward the house. Billy dials a number on a phone, but before anyone can answer, Aunt Cheryl hangs it up with her fingers. Yeah, I, I love the hand reaching out from the frame and yeah. just, like, pressing on the, the... Cradle? Cradle. But he uh, takes him a second to realize that someone disconnected the call. It didn't just cut out on its own. Cheryl asks who he's trying to call. Girlfriend. Oh, oh forget it. I'm your girl. She admits that she killed her sister to get him back and she'll kill him too if she has to. She slaps crazily at him until Billy swipes up a letter opener from the floor and jabs it into her heart. With her last gasp of life, she tries to make out with her son and he tries again (laughs) to use the phone, but he doesn't call the police because Carlson has been nothing but antagonistic the whole time. Coach Lanners, this is Billy Lynch. All right. I, I need your help. My, my mother's dead. Your mother? What are you talking about? My mother's dead. I just killed her. Right, hold on. You'll have it right there. I think it's a weird choice that he says mother here. Mm-hmm. Like this is information that confuse he's him, yeah. literally just found out. And like, I don't feel like he's uh, conscious enough here to have really internalized that knowledge. Right. And then you're saying it to somebody who also doesn't have that knowledge. Who thinks knowledge. your mom died 14 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think, though, that in this situation that Coach Landers would know what he means. Like, the woman who's in your house all the time, yeah. who we've just learned is a psychopath, you probably killed her in self-defense, I'll be right there. Because I agree with you that Carlson's not going to take this well. As soon as Billy hangs up, Cheryl snarls back to life and slashes at Billy repeatedly. Sometime later, the police find Margie dead in the yard. Lieutenant Carlson arrives late to the scene. You seen Cook? Yeah, he's dead. Inside the house, Carlson finds Coach Landers tending to Billy's wounds, and now... The mother is dead again. She is. She took these last few swipes and then she officially bled out and died. And and this was like another one of those moments where I'm like, this is such a, a unique standout movie, the way it's handling this gay character and right. this relationship because it's just like, oh my God, you thought he was screwed before. Now he is like... Because he's involving himself in this situation. Yeah, because he is here and and this woman is dead and it almost just corroborates exactly what the sergeant was saying about him. Right. It's like, oh, you you two are in a relationship and and you want her out of the way. Yeah. And what's also interesting is that the pacing of the movie makes you feel like she's dead now. Like this guy showed up to help him. He's like tending to his wounds. She's been dead and not moving on the floor for a while. This is denouement. The movie's over. So... Why is there this much time left? How, how can you pace a scene like this after the climax? Inside the house, Carlson finds Coach Landers tending to Billy's wounds. He trains his gun on the boy and accuses him of having killed all these people. Insanely, Julie, bleeding profusely from the head, is still alive yeah. and led into the room by another cop. And I, because I was so sure she was dead at this point that I'm just like, nobody's going to believe them. No, mm. Nobody will believe right. them. Uh, and then she shows up and I'm like, holy cow. The like, one person. The yeah. only person in this entire film that could that could save them at this point is right. still here. 
but she does have a lot of head injuries. That's so true, maybe, yeah. So <laughs> like, maybe, are you so sure? <laughs> maybe not the best testimony. Trust me, Dimmy didn't do any of this. <laughs> you mean Billy? Gibby. <laughs> she just falls on her face. <laughs> Gibby. <laughs> Julie confirms Billy's story that Cheryl killed everyone and then tried to kill Julie. As we've established, Carlson doesn't want to hear anything that conflicts with his theory. He orders Julie escorted home. <laughs> Don't take her testimony. Just get her to her house, flop a Band-Aid on her head, she'll be fine. Let her take a nap if she's tired. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's important that she gets as much bed rest as possible. Carlson turns and pistol whips Coach Lander so hard that his face is gushing blood. He chambers around to shoot Billy, but Landers knocks the lieutenant's gun out of his hand with the fireplace brush. Billy picks the gun up and points at Carlson to protect Coach Landers because now the two men are fighting each other. Carlson tries to call his bluff, and after a lot of pleading, Billy shoots the lieutenant. <laughs> I was not expecting this moment. Yeah. Like, so many of these moments in a row that the lieutenant would point the gun at him mm -hmm. and basically say, I'm going to solve this murder tonight, and we're not going to have to deal with this problem anymore, and that it turned around so that the kid killed yeah. the lieutenant. But now I'm assuming that Billy's screwed. That he's right, like, exactly. Now he's just going to go to jail anyways, even though he didn't do any of this. The reaction to the first squib explosion looks very authentic because it mostly is. The squib was on backward, and Bo Svensson was badly injured when it exploded. A few more shots take the man down. The cop escorting Julie rushes back to the crime scene after hearing multiple shots fired and gives Julie permission to comfort her boyfriend, even though he just killed the lieutenant. Yeah. He's like, you know what? Yeah, he's probably pretty broken up about this. But uh, I could also see, like, God, Lieutenant Carlson was an yeah. asshole. Yeah, it's like, really not <laughs> what was it? Uh, improper channels where he was like, he was like, yeah, we all hated that cop that you attacked. So you, we, we're not going to press charges because we all hate him, too. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, that's the only way that you get away with this is that everyone knows he's a maniac and he's been killing innocent people for a while. Julie nuzzles against him by the fireplace and the shot slows to a freeze frame before an epilogue scrolls by. Billy Lynch stood trial for the slaying of Lieutenant Carlson. The proceedings lasted only four days and the jury unanimously acquitted him on the grounds of temporary insanity. Julie Linden and Billy are currently attending the University of Denver. So that's not how that works. No, no. <laughs> um, if he were charged with the murder and they decided it wasn't self-defense, even with multiple witnesses to mm. the fact that this guy was crazy and ready to kill him, I guess Landers is the only witness that he has on his own side and they would say, oh, he's your lover. So, of course, he's going to say that. But the other cop knows that Carlson's a maniac and this girl is corroborating that Cheryl was the killer here. Right. But if you get acquitted on grounds of temporary insanity, like, no, you, you go to an asylum and you stay there for, like, longer than if you murdered a person. Mm -hmm. Like, we discussed that in Bronco Billy when uh, the uh, Jeffrey Lewis character agrees to to plead guilty and temporary insanity so that he doesn't go to to jail for killing her, but they send him to an asylum and it's a permanent situation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then he has to break out later. But, yeah, this is this, – he wouldn't just be – it's like, all right, now off to school with your girlfriend, you crazy person who murdered someone. Yeah, because, I mean, clearly they're going to search the house. They're going to find the evidence right. about all this other stuff. So it, the the only charge that's going to be against, against Billy is the killing of the police officer. Yeah, and the fact that there's a headless corpse in her shed. Like, there's, there's a lot working against Cheryl's memory mm -hmm. here. Even if they were able to kill this girl, it's like this body has been dead for 14 years. So Billy didn't do that. Yeah, and... I mean, assuming they believe the testimony of Landers that that this cop was going to kill them both, right? To you know, just in order to have this murder be off the books. Yeah, and I think if Sergeant Cook were still around, that would work to their advantage. Mm -hmm. But he's not. <laughs> I'm I'm presuming he did not survive the second machete swipe. I don't mention him in our cast notes for the episode because this is his only credit. But Riley Morgan, who played Chuck Strang in Aunt Cheryl's photographs in her shed was also the film's assistant prop man in the credits. Mm. No clue why this is called Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker or Night Warning for that matter. There were a lot of movies in 1982 that started with the word night so it's possible they were just looking to get rented by mistake because you had Night Crossing, Night Shift, Night of the Shooting Stars, and Night Beast. So if there's a night warning in there people might be like oh this is one of those movies. Um, apparently there's a novelization that was released alongside the film with 
the original release title, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, and it delves much deeper into all the characters' backstories and their fates beyond what we see other than the characters who actually show up in the epilogue. Um, so that would be... Couldn't we just neat, have think, had her read. butcher and bake something just to make the title well, make sense? Well, I think Margie is the baker, right? <laughs> yeah. She's got the pie and the cake that she's bringing over all the time. Well, yeah. And, and clearly Cheryl is the butcher. So who is the nightmare maker? So, so that's one of, the, one of the things I thought when Margie was in on it. Because she's always trying to cover for stuff that Cheryl is doing. <laughs> she shows up at inopportune moments. <laughs> yeah. Um, like she was just like. It's like, oh, I just wanted to close all the windows. And it's like, and I cleaned your refrigerator that was covered in blood. <laughs> but I did all this other stuff. I chopped up that girl's body that you just left in the middle of your yard. Yeah. Because you left her alive, you idiot. <laughs> but yeah, that's Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. This is a thumbs up for me. Um, it's really intense. It's got some really great twists to it. I love Susan Tyrell. I mean, honestly, like I was so excited. Like I didn't. I didn't realize she was in this. And then she is the first thing you see. And I'm just like, holy shit. I'm so excited for this. And even in her first scene, I was like, she's being a little creepy. But this is like, it's interesting to see such a subdued character from Susan Tyrell. And then as the story evolves, you're like, oh, shit. No, this is still like Queen Doris. Like, this is she's madness. totally insane. This movie was very unexpected. Like, everything that happened, uh, how they handled the relationships, how creepy she was. Like, I was squirming in my chair. Oh, my God. When she licks Billy's neck. Oh, uh, when she spills the milk all over I him? I just about jumped out of my skin. Yeah, like I, that's real gross. Oh, my God. Um, definitely a thumbs up. I was uh, pleasantly surprised by this movie. What are we thinking letterbox for this one? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a thumbs down for me. Oh, really? Oh, Richard. I, uh, I, I don't know. It, it didn't. It didn't really do anything for me. Um, I thought it was interesting, but I would never watch it again. I I definitely will watch this again. Yeah. I mean, her performances were just so over the top. I love that she's the only one going so bonkers. I've, and I feel like second place is Bo Svensson. Oh, yeah. No, he where, definitely Where it's just knows. like, holy shit, why are you doing that right now? Like, they're <laughs> the same kind of crazy person. And I love how the plot evolves from this is a movie about a psychopath woman trying to kill everyone that's keeping her and her son apart. And then it evolves to now this is a movie about a psychopath lieutenant at the police station who thinks he knows what happened and is going to kill anyone who disagrees with him basically at this point. But yeah, what are you thinking, Letterboxd? Uh, I have it in second place right now. It's below Zoot Suit and above Venom. Richard, where you got this one? Uh, I have it in eighth place, which puts it uh, below Aftermath but above <laughs> The Seduction. <laughs> what? Wrong. Oh, Incorrect. I mean, I like Aftermath. That's crazy. It's above the seduction. <sighs> yes, it is. It's <laughs> above the subduction zone. What? I have it in second place also. That's just under Zoot Suit. For me, that's just above Vice Squad. Our director here was William Asher. He previously directed hundreds of I Love Lucy's and hundreds of Bewitched. Like, more than half of each show. Bulk of the series. Yeah. <laughs> he was actually married to Samantha actress Elizabeth Montgomery. Other film work includes the Beach Party films, Beach Party, Bikini Beach, and Beach Blanket Bingo, as well as some of the Gidget TV series. Later credits include several TV adaptations of films like Alice, the Foul Play series, and the Private Benjamin series. The other director for just that first car crash scene was Michael Miller. Later this season, he directs Silent Rage, and much later, he directed an episode of Sliders. The writer here was Steve Brimer for the screenplay. This is his only writing credit. The other screenplay credit and story credit goes to Alan J. Gluckman, who later writes Ruskies in 87, uh, one-off TV gigs like an episode of the 93 Swamp Thing show and an episode of Xena Warrior Princess. Boone Collins also has a screenplay credit. He wrote and directed Abducted and Abducted 2. The music here came from Bruce Langhorn. He previously scored Melvin and Howard. Robbie Greenberg was the second cinematographer. Later this season, he lights both Swamp Thing and Time Walker, and later Free Willy, Snow Day, a couple episodes of Prison Break, Santa Claus 3, and Wild Hogs. Cinematographer Jan de Bont was let go after that opening sequence when uh, Michael Miller was let go. Technically, he's only credited for one week of shooting for what most trivia sections call the decapitation scene, but I don't think the head actually separates from the body in the car accident. It might be an internal decapitation, but it doesn't like come out the back window with the log, which would have been pretty sweet too. He's a nearly headless Nick. Right. 
We've seen his work so far in the difficult watch double feature of Private Lessons and Roar. He later lights Cujo, All the Right Moves, Clan of the Cave Bear, Die Hard, Black Rain, Hunt for Red October, and Basic Instinct. When someone pitched Die Hard on a bus to 20th Century Fox, they went to director John McTiernan with a contract, who turned it down but suggested his Die Hard collaborator cinematographer Jan DeBont to direct. Speed became DeBont's blockbuster debut, and he followed it directing Twister, Speed 2, The Haunting, and Tomb Raider 2. So he brought Paxton back, even though they definitely didn't work together on this film at all. They're just both credited in it. Or no, DeBont's not even credited. The editor here was Ted Nicolau. He previously cut Tourist Trap, and so far on the show, The Daytime Ended and Roar. Later, he cuts Dungeon Master, Ghoulies, and Trancers. He also directed Dungeon Master and later Terror Vision, and lately a lot of direct-to-video horror stuff. Jimmy McNichol played Billy Lynch. Last season we saw him as the lead in Smokey Bites the Dust. He's also the brother of Christy McNichol, and they're the spitting image of each other. Like, they even have the same haircut at this, <laughs> at this year in their life. Like, they could easily have just brought her in to play him for scenes. But uh, not many credits I recognize after this. So he was the bigger name over Bill Paxton at the time, but um, it seems like he didn't continue working much beyond the early 80s. Susan Tyrell was Cheryl Roberts. She was Oma in Fat City. We saw her last as the Queen of the Sixth Dimension in Richard Elfman's Forbidden Zone. Later, she shows up in the Angel Trilogy and John Waters' Crybaby. For a long time, Tyrell claimed never to have seen this film, assuming it was awful. And when she finally caught it in 2008, she said she thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> I've been telling people to avoid this for years. <laughs> she was also in uh, one of the Pee Wees, right? Big Top Pee Wee? Montana something. Uh, Midge Montana. Midge Montana. Bo Svensson played Detective Joe Carlson. We saw him last as a colonel in our minisode review of Virus Day of Resurrection. I usually think of his role as Reverend Harmony officiating the central wedding of Kill Bill Volume 2. He also shows up again in Inglorious Bastards after having played a part in the OG Inglorious Bastards. Marsha Lewis played Margie. We'll see her next as Frog Lady in The Ice Pirates. Julia Duffy played Julie Linden. She was actually 10 years older than Jimmy McNichol playing her boyfriend. So she was 30 and he was 20, both playing high schoolers. We saw her last as Young Girl in Cutter's Way, but she's probably best known as Stephanie Vanderkellen in 163 episodes of New Heart and later for regular roles on Baby Talk, Designing Women, and The Mommies. But on Designing Women, I think she was a sugar baker. Sugar baker nightmare maker. <laughs> <laughs> Britt Leach played Sergeant Cook. He reunites with Bill Paxton in Weird Science. I think he's, is he Bill Paxton's dad in Weird Science? No, he's uh, Anthony Michael dad. Hall's dad. Oh, okay. Who's Gary? <laughs> <laughs> is that him? That's his yeah. line? Oh, that's great. Uh, we've seen him now in Coming Attractions, a.k.a. Loose Shoes, Hardly Working, and our Minnesota review of PSI Factor. He showed up next on New Heart and later as Mr. Potter in Last Starfighter. He's Mr. Sims in Weird Science and Reg in The Great Outdoors. I think that's the guy who gets struck by lightning. Steve Easton played Tom Landers. We've seen him so far in a Minnesota review of Cloud Dancer, A Change of Seasons, and The Devil and Max Devlin. He also shows up in MacGyver episode Twice Stung. Bill Paxton was Eddie. This is the first time we've seen him act after a couple films set dressing, specifically Battle Beyond the Stars and Galaxy of Terror, because he was already a go-to employee of James Cameron's work. He's credited in Stripes, but I don't remember seeing him in that. He's back this season for Mortuary and later Terminator, Weird Science with Britt Leach again, Commando, Predator 2, The Dark Backward, Tombstone, Apollo 13, Twister, and one of his last big credits was as Bill Henriksen on 53 episodes of Big Love. He originally auditioned for the lead of this film, but he was the second choice of filmmakers and offered the Eddie role as a consolation prize. If you haven't seen The Dark Backward, do yourself the favor it's him and Judd Nelson in this weird futuristic movie where they work in like a junkyard. It's really fucking strange. I think it's a great double feature with street trash because there's so much junkyard photography in both of them. Um, and they're just bizarre films. But he's like a stand-up comedian. <laughs> Judd Nelson is a stand-up comedian who has like an arm growing out of his back or something. My best friend called me a weirdie. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It's so good. And uh, Bill Paxton has like a a foursome with these like big fat characters like prostitute women that he buys or something and he brings them back to the house and he's like trying to tell Judd Nelson to join them all in the party and stuff it's really weird but it's super funny uh Gary Baxley played Bill Lynch Sr. he was a punk in the Warriors and Randy Norton played student Tony I don't remember a Tony but he's credited as Jeep Guy in Honky Tonk Freeway and later he voices Larn in Fire and Ice those are all the credits I have for this one.
I think that's everything for Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't think it helps our visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, maybe you should join our Patreon at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. What's that sound? We got one! That's right. It's a new patron, Patrick Troutman. As a $5 patron of the show, Patrick now has access to 49 full-size 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. For April of 1974, our $5 patrons are choosing between the following six titles. Caged Heat, The Conversation, Foxy Brown, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, It's Alive, and Truck Turner for a 50th anniversary review next month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Butterfly, which IMDb describes like so. In 1937 Nevada, Silvermine caretaker Jess Tyler is reunited with his teenage daughter Katie, who will do anything to persuade Jess to let her have claim to the mine. We leave you now with the trailer for Butterfly. What we did was bound to happen the first day we met. And when it did, it was good for both of us. I come to stay with you. Keep you from being lonely. A man of honor. Doesn't it shame you just a little bit to go making up to every single man you meet? What's to be ashamed of? And a woman with none. What happens between them will change both of them for better, for worse, forever. He ain't like any other man. He's the gentlest man I ever know. He never forced me into anything. He loves me. Sexual relations between persons too closely related by blood to be entitled to marry. That's what it means. He came in contact with temptations that he'd never been faced with before. He gave in to those temptations of riotous living, strong wine, and the sin of lust and fornication. Come on! Get off me! Get off me! <laughs> I ever had a paper dollar bill in my hand. I was 12 years old. I let one of the boarders spend the night with me. Maybe that was bad. But the things I bought with that money was good. And if that's bad, then I want to be bad. The silver. Come with me and I'll show you. Your Honor, she ain't done nothing wrong. Me neither. Not my daughter. That's a lie. <laughs> Stacy Keach, Lois Nettleton, Orson Welles, Stuart Whitman, Edward Albert, James Franciscus, and introducing Pia Zadora. Butterfly. <laughs>